once again and welcome to another edition of my Weekly Bond. Today we're going to be continuing our redos of the reviews of the first few James Bond films by looking at a Bond film that is considered by many to be the best Bond film ever. The Bond to beat. The Bond to end all Bonds. Or at least it was considered to be all those things at one point. I do think that the mass opinion of this film has changed quite significantly, despite it still being one of my personal favourite films of the franchise, and indeed favourite films of all time. But why? Why has opinion of this film changed so significantly over the past few years? Well, that's just one of the things we're going to be looking at today as we review the third feature-length James Bond adventure, Goldfinger. So the film begins with the Bob Simmons gun barrel before we open on a classic Bond pre-title sequence. By that I mean a sequence that has absolutely nothing to do with the rest of the film, but provides us with some preliminary style, action, and humour. Bond arrives, actually, in a very unstylish manner, with a seagull attached to his head. I guess Q Branch have a taxidermy division? Um, anyway, Bond plants some explosives in a Mexican drug lord's den, and then it's off with the wetsuit to reveal a perfectly dry, white, took Cedo beneath before an explosion, and then Bond meets with some girl and rather implausibly sees in her eye the reflection of an assailant behind him. <gasps> and that's our hero, boys and girls, the one using the woman as a human shield. Anyway, we have a nice little fight sequence before Connery delivers one of his signature Bond lines. Shocking. Positively shocking. And then it's on to the title sequence. Uh, oh, wait! Before we continue on with this portion of the film, I, I just need to do something uh, v v very quickly. It's just, it's re really quite a, you know, it's, it's, it's imperative, actually. It's imperative to my actual health. Right, continue. It penetrates even earplugs. Before I talk about this song, can I just say, I am not a bad person. I think of myself as a productive member of society, and I praise and love most things about the James Bond films. So please don't hate me just because I don't like this one classic song. This song. This song. It, okay, I get it. I get it. I get that it's a classic song. How come it wasn't in your top ten Bond songs video and all that, but... It, it's just far too loud and brassy for me. I, I I like most of the rest of Goldfinger's score, but this song by itself is just physically painful to listen to. I, I, I much prefer the song when it's being sung in a more gentle cover rendition. But here, uh, you know, as much... You know, okay, though, fair enough. As much as I may dislike the brassiness of the music, Bassy herself does a fine job singing, and there's no denying this is one of the more memorable Bond themes, even if it, it does cause blood to explode from my ears every time it's played. I mean, honestly, you could play this song on the moon and my sound receptors would still wince. I don't know if it's partly because of the... the, the bit of a backlash that I got from my top 10 Bond songs video about not having it on there. I don't know if that's why I'm now so sensitive about hearing this song, but literally every time I hear it, I just have to cover my ears. Ah, it's wonderful to have a day off. Time to listen to some radio in bed, I think. Hello and welcome to BBC Radio 4's film music programme. That was the main title theme from Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and next up we have the classic James Bond theme, Goldfinger. <laughs> Anyway, after the titles, it's off to Miami, where Bond meets with our Felix, played by Sec Linda, who tells Bond that M wants him to keep an eye on a guy who is also staying at the hotel named Goldfinger, who, according to the MI6 reports, is an Englishman. Morning, Mr. Simmons. Ready for a little game? Sure, I'm ready. When you're ten grand in the hole, you're ready for anything. Could I have my usual seat? Right. Uh, was Money Penny drunk when she was writing up Goldfinger's profile? I don't think there's a more un-English looking or sounding man on the planet than this guy. Anyway, Bond gets into Goldfinger's suite and meets with Goldfinger's assistant, Jill Masterton, played by Shirley Eaton, and discovers Goldfinger is actually cheating at guards and promptly foils him. This whole sequence utilises a mix of location footage, set footage, and back projection that should be really annoying and it is kind of distracting, but the actors are so captivating in these scenes, what's going on in the story is very interesting, you kind of forgive the film for the, you know, cheap, fake-looking backgrounds, I think. 
Anyway, after cavorting with Jill, Bond takes a swipe at the Beatles for some reason. My dear girl, there are some things that just aren't done, such as drinking Dom Perignon 53 above a temperature of 38 degrees Fahrenheit. That's as bad as listening to the Beatles without earmuffs. Before a mystery character takes a swipe at him. Connery wakes up a little bit later on to find in front of him one of the most iconic images in all of cinema. That must have been some blow to the head for Bond to be asleep all this time. It's not like it's some five minute job covering a person's entire body in gold paint. Despite Jill's murder obviously being down to Goldfinger, no one decides to arrest him and instead MI6 decide to investigate him on the suspicion of smuggling gold. Like, you know, who else? Who else in the world would kill someone by suffocating them in gold paint? It's not exactly Cluedo, is it? But anyway, the scene where Bond finds Masterton is a complete master stroke. Everything about the scene is incredible. It sets up the series for the next few decades, and fortunately we don't have M popping up out of nowhere to give Bond a lecture about trust and morals and crap. Like in a certain other Bond film where a girl is suffocated in an expensive substance. Anyway, despite only knowing Jill for an hour or so, Bond is really quite pissed off by her death. To the extent that he seems to be more pissed off about her than he later does about Aki and knew and lived twice, and at least he knew Aki for a good few days. Though I do prefer to think that Bond is pissed off here more because he's mad at himself for not being more on his toes. He was outsmarted, really. By painting the girl gold, Goldfinger has made a fool of Bond, and that's why Bond is pissed off, rather than any personal or emotional attachment to Jill Masterton herself. Bond quickly snaps out of this mood and is on top form at a dinner at the Bank of England, disgruntling M with his superior knowledge of brandy. It's also here we get some more of the plot. The Bank of England asks MI6 to investigate Goldfinger to find out how exactly he's smuggling gold from country to country. Of course, Bond sets off on his mission, but not before he is equipped by everyone's favourite gadget master in a scene that sets up the standard of Q Branch scenes for, well, the rest of the franchise. Audio visual range 150 miles. Ingenious and useful too. Allow a man to stop off for a quick one en route. It has not been perfected out of years of patient research entirely for that purpose, 007. It's a fun scene and one that sets up the Bond Q relationship at this point perfectly. I'll, pr I'll probably talk about this more in a more Q specific video, but I just want to say here that I really genuinely love how the Bond Q relationship is one that actually does evolve over the course of the series. I mean, here at the beginning, <laughs> there's a lot of contempt between these two men, and later on it becomes more friendly contempt, and then in the Dalton Brosnan eras, it becomes almost like a friendly father figure. I just, I, you don't see it that often in Bond films where a relationship progresses over multiple films, so I, I like it that they did it with Q, whether intentional or unintentional. Anyway, the scene is also famous for introducing us to the sexiest thing ever to grace a Bond film, the Aston Martin DB5, with modifications. Next up is one of my favourite sequences in the film, the golf match with Goldfinger. I love everything about this scene, the dialogue, the style, the characters, how it's shot, and oh my god, I love it. The moment when Bond drops the gold bar that he got from the Bank of England, he just drops it right next to Goldfinger's ball just before he puts, and it makes Goldfinger miss. It's so good. Good. But what does that mean for the game? Goldfinger never actually puts the ball. Did he make par? I simply must know. Goldfinger loses his ball in the rough, prompting one of my personal most quoted lines in all of Bond. Oh, what a pity. Here it is. No, it's not. He plays a Slazenger 1. In fact, me and my friends used to quote this caddy guy quite a lot. I don't even know why. We just found it highly amusing to randomly drop into conversations lines like, It's your runner, sir. He plays a Flathinger one. And the ball you found, sir. I love this guy a lot. He's just, he's just got one of those great faces. I don't think I've ever seen him act in any other film, but he's just, oh, he's great. I love him. It's your runner, sir. It's all right. If this were a Roger Moore Bond film, he'd probably be some kind of undercover Swiss agent or something who'd be killed by odd job with a three iron in the club toilets or something. Bond wins the match through an enforced technicality, and we get a display of Oddjob's cool razor-rimmed hat and super strength before Bond follows the bear using his tracking device to an airport where I swear the announcer has one of the weirdest accents I've ever heard. Uh, I 
I repeat, British in our head airfares announced departure of the VA-12 Hurtnipa. So it's off to Switzerland where Bond follows Goldfinger and finds this mysterious woman who seemingly takes a shot at Bond with a sniper. Bond retaliates naturally by ripping her car to shreds with his gadget-laden Aston. Look at them! Look at them! How can you be focusing solely on the tyres at this point? I mean, I, I don't care how rare a double blowout is. Have you not noticed that giant tear down the side of your car? I'm pretty sure that's a more rare occurrence than a double blowout. Bond picks up the girl, known as Tilly, and finds out, well, nothing from her other than she's very suspicious and seems to have trouble acting nonchalant when asked awkward questions. But saying that, I think anyone would act troubled if they were in a car with a man who was behaving a bit like this. Is it just me or does Connery act slightly uh, psychotic during this bit? Or at least weird? I mean, it's, it's no wonder Tilly wants to get out at the next gas station. Here for the hunting season. I had a case just like that one. It's for my ice skates. Lovely sport. It's one of my favourite sports, actually. Ice skating. There's something so satisfying about it. That feeling you get when you dig that razor-sharp blade into the ice. It's the same rush I get when I dig a kitchen knife into a woman's fine, soft flesh. <laughs> There's a garage. Later, Bond goes snooping around Goldfinger's factory and discovers the villain is smuggling gold out of countries by disguising the stuff as part of his Rolls Royce. We learn this over dialogue which does not in any way, shape, or form match the mouth movements of the characters. Use gold in this special furnace to make them switch it turn with any smoking way. Approximately two tons. <coughs> Bond bumps into Tilly again, who it turns out is Jill Masterton's sister, and the pair embark on the series' first gadget-laden car chase. Is this where Wacky Racers got their ideas from? <laughs> We also get another villain's car that spontaneously bursts into flames, much like the one from Doctor No. I guess a boot full of gasoline and dynamite is standard issue equipment for all villains, henchmen. Reaching the end of the road, Tilly runs off into the forest but is killed by Oddjob's hat. Bond immediately laments the fact that he never got to shag her. Well, I should push, she'll be warm for a few hours more. There's still time! Bond is captured and then driven back to Goldfinger's factory. Or drives himself, it seems, in his own car? Really? They're going to make this man drive his own gadget-laden car? That's kinda stupid! Oh well, at least we get one of the best moments in the film out of it. Bond crashes his car into a wall after driving around Pinewood Studios recklessly and is captured and tied down to a slab so we can have one of THE classic Bond scenes, if not one of the most classic scenes in all of cinema. If Goldfinger is remembered for one scene, it's this one. And it's everything its reputation would have you believe it is. It's wonderful, suspenseful, Connery sells it really well. In fact, Connery is really key to this scene working. A lot of the time, as Bond, he's just Connery's just enjoying himself, you know, he's giving the audience a wry smile. But here he looks genuinely terrified. He sees no way out, he's sweating, and so we're really sold on the danger of this situation because he looks like he's genuinely nervous and anxious about this. Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die.